Apple recently released a new research report that is debunking much of the hype around the current AI craze, or so they claim, in a new report entitled The Illusion of Thinking, Understanding the Strengths and Limitations of Reasoning Models via the Lens of Problem Complexity. It got me thinking that I'm seeing two categories of folks right now when it comes to AI. The first is those who are frozen by AI. They don't really understand what the technology does. They don't really understand what it's capable of right now versus what it's not. And they have sort of a dystopian view of the future, which is unfounded based on the present state of the technology. And the second is those who are building with it, those who really understand what it does, how it works, its real capabilities, its weaknesses, and who are using this to build massive leverage for themselves. After I published my last video, I saw the same fears and misunderstandings over and over again in the comments. And they basically were like, you don't get it. It's already smarter than humans and we're doomed and it's mass unemployment and so forth. And I realized something, which is most people reacting to a myth, not the technology itself. And so in this video, I want to break down what AI really is, why it is both at the same time wildly overhyped in some areas and then wildly underhyped in others. Because if you get this wrong, you are not only missing out on what is going to be one of the biggest opportunities for leverage, freedom, and wealth creation in the modern world, but you're also going to spend a bunch of time, energy, and effort investing in skills, investing in projects that aren't going to be relevant in two years. So I want to talk for a second about why I am both optimistic as well as skeptical about everything that's being discussed with AI right now. I've spent my entire career in technology, and I can tell you that founders, as a rule, dramatically overstate read lie, <laughs> about the capabilities of their technology, both to get press and for marketing purposes. I'll give you just a few examples, but I could make a whole video just about the claims that I've heard founders make with their technology of what turned out to be absolute nonsense. So I worked with a company who had a, quote, matching algorithm that was supposed to predict the success of a retail business in a given available retail space. And this was, by the way, using machine learning and AI, a lot of the stuff we're still talking about now. But what was that algorithm actually? It was this, it was this very rich guy's 19 year old son sitting at a coffee table in his expansive West Hollywood offices, flipping through co-star listings, which is like Zillow for commercial properties, deciding what he thought might work in a given space and then plugging it back into the system. I had a, a security company that was supposedly using their proprietary threat algorithm to rank threats for CISOs, chief information security officers, using their threat matrix. Okay, this was another proprietary algorithm using machine learning and so forth. What that proprietary algorithm was, was basically a small team in India that was looking at IT tickets and ranking lost laptops, like by red or yellow or green, depending on, you know, who the person was and what the you know, the, the severity of the information that was probably on their laptop. I was recently looking at an AI content repurposing tool, the back end of this thing with their product team and talking about, so what, like, how does this thing, and so the purpose of this tool is that it's supposed to flag viral or it's supposed to pick out viral content from your long form content. And then it's going to repurpose it in a bunch of different ways. And I was like, so how does this thing pick out the viral content? All it's doing is picking out specific words, like anything that they see as uh, elevated energy, crazy or ridiculous, right? So it flags these specific words that are supposed to be viral when it has no idea of your intent of your content, the intent of what you're doing. And then it takes those words by transcript and repurposes them, basically cuts it into 30 and 60 second segments starting slightly before and slightly after the clip. And then it uses pre-templated things to take transcript text and plug it in there. An amazing automation, a brain it is not. We work lost $16 billion in investment capital by saying that they, they were taking shared office space and it was a tech company. And on my podcast, Udi Lettergore is he's the CEO at the time, he was the CMO of Gong. I asked him, what's the most important thing in startup marketing? And he, he made the comment, if you're in tech, you know who Udi is, that startup marketing is all about talking about what you hope your product is going to do in two years in a way that sounds like its present state. This is one of the guys who's been in the game as long as anybody. People wildly overstate the capabilities of their technology to get press. Full stop. So what does, let's talk about what artificial intelligence 
artificial intelligence actually is today and if it is actually artificially intelligent at all. What we are calling AI right now is better phrased as natural language computing. There is actually almost nothing intelligent about what it's doing right now. AI is not thinking, it is pattern matching. It does this very, very fast and very, very well, but it is simply pattern matching. So how does all this work? Here's what happens when you ask ChatGPT a question. Let's say you say, I'm hungry, what should I eat for lunch? AI or ChatGPT or whatever model you use takes that and breaks it down into what's called tokens, which is just pieces of that phrase, that syntax. And each one gets a mathematical value attached to it. That gets pushed into a predictive algorithm, which basically says these tokens in this order, what is statistically most likely going to be the response to this, you know, the next thing that comes after these tokens are presented. That's it. It's a, it's a very advanced probability engine. And the reason, by the way, that this thing is, was such a breakthrough and works with any degree of accuracy and its present state is one, the big breakthrough for modern LLMs, large language models, was this insight that they thought if we threw enough data at these models, that they would get better. And they did. And at the time, a lot of people didn't actually believe that that was the case. They didn't necessarily think that all these folks were, or these models would just get better with more and more data. The second thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is these models are essentially trained just by millions and millions of interactions from people. It's not thinking about anything. They reinforce the statistical probability with very low wage work, which basically says, what is gonna come next in this sentence? You present it to people over millions of iterations and they verify what should come next in the sequence. That's how these models work. And they're doing that now. There's com there's full companies out there that are providing outsourced labor for um, like higher skilled results. So they're, they're helping connect companies with doctors or lawyers or accountants who are gonna train models further based on human reinforcement to these models. If you're in ChatGPT and you see it's like, which response do you prefer? You are training the model for it. It's not thinking about anything. It's just pattern matching. And if you ever wondered why you sometimes get totally weird results at a chat GPT that make no sense, there's something in the models called temperature. And what temperature is, is basically, so let's say you ask the question, I'm hungry, what should I eat for lunch? And in 90% of the instances that this thing's been trained on, people say you should have a sandwich. But in 0.01% of the instances, people say you should have a marker with hot sauce. Even though that doesn't make any sense, 0.01% of the time people say that. And if you set the temperature to zero, it simply is gonna tell you the most likely next word. So the 90% of the time thing. And if you set it to one, it's gonna start doing crazy stuff like telling you to eat a marker for lunch. That is the level of quote intelligence that we are currently dealing with. And by the way, even the even Sam Altman, the OpenAI founder, has said these models are really just really good next word predictors. He doesn't share much of this dystopian fear around, you know, the tool is going to take over and so forth. This is very much in human control and we are a very long way. We'll talk more about too the limitations of the current technology we have and why there's a huge probability that this dystopian future everyone has that to go from natural language computing to any sort of true AI is simply, it, it, it's it, one doesn't get you to the other. And we'll also talk about what the opportunity is right now for folks with the PREC technology as it says today. So a step, a quote from Altman talking about chat G or GPT-4. Basically, he says, you should not rely on this thing for acumen, accurate information. In another article, he explains, over the last six months, he has also been working to lower the bar for his predictions around AGI. <laughs> And what he says here is, my guess is we'll hit AGI, art we'll talk about how he defines artificial general intelligence and if it's really a proxy for intelligence. It, we're gonna hit AGI sooner than most people think and it's going to matter much less. The world mostly goes on in mostly the same way, things grow faster, but then there's a long continuation from what we call AGI to what we call super intelligence. Gary Marcus, who is another prominent figure in uh, the AI movement, has basically said without mixing words on the whole thing that anyone thing who thinks LLMs are direct route to AGI is kidding themselves. And we can see some commentary here from Josh Wolf, who's a, a respected guy in the VC space talking about 
um, basically how at complex reasoning, these models fully fall apart. There are people who are levying criticism against the way that they've run these tests and so forth. We're not going to go into all the weeds of it here, but let's just say we are a long way from AGI. Hey, future me here. If you are enjoying this content and you're finding it valuable and you're interested in the future of work, solo business, the topics we're talking about here, would you take just a second, like, subscribe. It's completely free. It helps the channel very much. I appreciate it. And with that, let's get back to the video. All right, summing this up, in their present state, LLMs do not understand, they do not plan, they do not even check themselves for accuracy. All they are doing is in the totality of the data that they've been trained on based on human reinforcement, they are saying this is what is most likely to come next in this sequence of tokens. That is what they are doing. And they are incredibly good at that thing. And that technology is incredibly useful in a wide variety of circumstances a replacement for thinking, it is not. So let's now talk about the truth about AGI and ASI. There's basically three categories of AI that we can think about when we're having this discussion about, you know, how is AI gonna impact the job market? How is it going to affect human labor? How is it going to affect you? And there's narrow AI, which is really natural language computing, which is what we have today, which is a new interface and a new way to engage in technology. Uh, to engage with computers, an incredibly useful tool. We'll talk about the most useful applications, but very limited also in what it can really do. The next is artificial general intelligence. That starts to be where humans, like you feel like you're dealing with another person. We'll give a precise definition for this in a second. And then there's artificial super intelligence, which is the dystopian future where the thing starts teaching itself and takes over society and so forth. What we are dealing with now, fancy autocomplete, is light years away from this idea of artificial superintelligence. So let's start by defining AGI and then talk about the limitations of the technology. Sam Altman has defined this. It's a useful definition for all of us. When we talk about AGI is that AGI is the median human. It's the equivalent of a median human that you could hire as a coworker. So what is this actually going to do in a thinking context? It is going to do basic tasks where rote copying is helpful and is no longer necessary. So the first draft of a contract, resizing banner ads, making rote predictions about, you know, medical diagnoses that happen in the same similar ways over and over again. What it is not doing in the present state and in anything that we've seen, back to my skepticism of people's big claims about their technology, is anything like true AGI and certainly not ASI. So here's a quote from Meta's chief AI scientist kind of talking about this idea. Kuhn, he says, today's AI systems are examples of narrow, are examples of narrow AI. They're good at specific tasks, but lack true general intelligence. People in AI have been making the mistake all the time saying, okay, we have systems now that can beat us at chess. So pretty soon they'll be as smart as we are. While the systems can handle cognitive reasoning tasks involving text, they fall apart when it comes to understanding and manipulating the physical world. We're not going to have an automated plumber anytime soon, etc. What the Apple paper goes on to explain, you can just look at the summary here, is that when you start to get into reasoning, these models completely collapse because prediction does not mean understanding. They are completely different things. And so they are not going to start running a dystopian, you know, government where they take everything over. <laughs> Here's a simple metaphor for us to contextualize where we are versus where we need to go. In the 60s, when the space race was going on, we made these huge leaps forwards in rocketry and they got us to the moon. And now we've even gone a little further with this and gone to Mars, you know, with unmanned craft. But those technological advances are completely uh, substandard to get us out of the galaxy, let alone to explore the whole universe. It's just what got us here can't get us there. And that is what many experts are predicting around LLMs, that while taking these large language models and training them on massive amounts of data has, predict has produced these incredible technological marvels, these language computers, one, just because it feels like you're talking to a person, it doesn't mean you are. It simply feels that way. We're anthropomorphizing the whole thing. <laughs> and this technology that we have today, these LLMs, they cannot get us to ASI. A completely different uh, approach will be required. 
doesn't mean we're never going to get there. It means we don't have anything like that right now. The real danger of AI right now is misunderstanding AI and misunderstanding the opportunity that you have in front of you. AI is not a digital brain. It is a wonderful tool to help you expand, elevate, amplify what you are already doing. It's great at drafting emails or summarizing documents or doing research for YouTube or organizing messy thoughts. Any place where if then pattern recognition is useful. But this kind of work is not the interesting work. If you think about the people that you admire, the people with a magnetic brand or the people who run a six or a seven figure consulting business or the people who have a successful solo software business, they don't feel like a copy. They're not just going to the mean. <laughs> they feel distinct and real and clear and they feel like a unique version of themselves. And my guess is for many of you out there, you do not feel like a copy of a copy you are distinct in your own voice as well. And this is where the big opportunity of AI is, is to amplify the skills, the expertise, and the like what you already know that other people don't. In the industrial economy, value came from being a cog. In the AI economy, it's going to be from being a node of insight. And this is available to all of us, if we are willing to lean in and use the insane technology that is being put in the palm of our hands. If you can solve a specific problem for a specific kind of person and amplify those solutions via automation with AI, you win and you win at a huge scale. You win with the opportunity to free up time to make far more money than you ever could internally and to do so in a leveraged way. And it's this leverage that is going to create freedom in the new economy. I want to close here with something that we talk about frequently in my community, the Leverage Lab. And I want to reiterate that I know many folks, this feels out of reach for them, but we have folks from all walks of life in this community who are monetizing their skills and expertise. There's 8 billion people in the world which is another way of saying there's an infinity number of people that you can sell things to. What we call this is the leverage stack. And this is the four pieces of it. There is a free uh, worksheet below if you wanna start to take advantage of this yourself. If you wanna take the next step, what I recommend is getting the freelance formula, which is the full system laid out for you. The leverage stack, knowledge, offer, systems, and scale. Knowledge, what are things that you are passionate about, that you are great at, whether it's a skill from work or a skill in your personal life that you want to become expert at? Offers, how do you then take that knowledge and use it as a point of transformation for others to help them go from, you know, diabetic and sick to healthy and, you know, no longer with diabetes or help them go from a bloated supply chain to a, you know, an efficient supply chain or help them go from unclear about their positioning, my business for the last 15 years, to clear and confident in how they're different and unique and how they show up to the world. Systems, how do you then deliver that result at scale using automation and so forth? And then scale, how do you then bring this to more and more people, divorcing your time for money simply by expanding the ways in which you service them, whether it's via products, productized services, a, a universe that you create in order to service people. And this is not a pie in the sky idea. There are very real people just like you who are taking, who simply get out of their comfort zone, take the action, and who instead of being paralyzed in the face of all this change are taking advantage of it. And these folks, whether or not you do it through our community, through the cheat sheet we have below, by taking the, like whatever is the right path for you, taking action to take advantage of change is how you are going to, uh, thrive in this era rather than be paralyzed. Let's close this whole thing out. Forget the dystopian vision, all right? This simply is not the case right now. We have the opportunity to create huge amounts of leverage for ourselves as individuals. And it all starts by understanding what the technology really is right now, what it isn't, and how to take action on it. I will link here to another video uh, talking about how I've used this exact system to build businesses for myself. And I'll share also some case studies from other folks here who are doing something very similar for themselves. And with that,